William Hurt is a scientist experimenting with the essence of the human brain in altered states, a special effects extravaganza, one of four new films we'll be reviewing on sneak previews, two critics talking about the latest movies in town. Across the aisle from me, Roger Ebert, film critic of the Chicago Sun-Times. And this is Gene Sisko, film critic of the Chicago Tribune. Gene, what's the matter with your eye there? I got an allergic reaction. It <laughs> might have been my dog of the week that I was looking for. <laughs> but uh, I took a pill for it just before we started to do the show, so maybe it'll be better by I, the end. I've had the same thing happen to me. It gets better okay. after a while. Anyway, in addition to Altered States, we'll also review Agatha Christie's The Mere Crack, the whodunit that turns into a comeback for Elizabeth Taylor, Kim Novak, and Rock Hudson. We'll also look at Francois Truffaut's new French film, The Green Room, and now Gene's going to start with a gory new thriller called Scanners. Now, viewers of this program should know by now that I have a very low tolerance for gory movies, but I must <laughs> admit that I enjoyed Scanners, even though it contains a scene where a human head explodes. I was intrigued by the plausibility of the story. That's why I like it. It's about a special breed of people called scanners who are able to focus their brain waves on other people to make them do whatever the scanners want. For example, there's Stephen Lack, who possesses the same supernatural ability, and he causes havoc when he scans the brain of an old woman in a shopping center restaurant. Will you look at that fellow over there? I've never seen anything so disgusting in all my life. I'll tell you something. He's staring at you. I think he's looking at us. I think we're being picked up. Oh, it's too awful. Can you believe it? I don't know how they get the creatures like that in here. <laughs> really. get the idea. You don't want to compete with that guy in a staring contest. That young man is really a pawn in a power game being played by two scientists, one good, one evil. The bad scientist wants to use a whole bunch of scanners to take over the world. Patrick McGowan is the good scientist who tries to help Stephen Lack control his scanning power. In this scene, McGowan takes him to a yoga master to teach him how to control his brainwaves. I want you to Slowly release your scan, slowly, with focus. I wanted to touch his heart, but not his brain. Who's that? Telepathy is not mind reading. It is the direct linking of two nervous systems separated by space. I want you to make a link from your brain to his heart. I want your brain to make his heart beat fast. Now, if his heart beats too quickly, then he will take over control of his heart and slow it down. Don't worry about him. All you have to do is make his heart beat faster. Now 
end your scam. End it. Stop him. End it. End it. Corny? <laughs> well, a little, but I got involved in it. I was never bored by Scanners, and I think I know why. This movie turns out to be a very complicated little thriller that actually convinces us that Scanners could exist. In other words, it's not just a cheap shocker where all we notice are the special effects. Instead, in Scanners, we buy the premise and we follow the story. I think it's a good little thriller. It's a good little thriller. I never bought the premise, and I never really bought the story either. I don't think there are really Scanners, and so I don't think it's plausible. I know that the movie was directed by somebody that horror film fans think is a real young genius, David Cronenberg, mm -hmm. who also directed They Came From Within and The Brood. I think mm -hmm. we've seen both of those films. I don't know. I admired his craft in this film. I th thought he did a good job of directing mm -hmm. it, but I never got involved in the people. I never thought of it as their story. Mm -hmm. So I was just watching actors going through this business, and then you get the, they're thinking real hard at each mm -hmm. other, and heads are exploding, and I'm thinking, oddly enough, I can admire the technique, but I don't care. Well, I got involved in the story, as I mentioned, and I got involved for three reasons. One, I do believe, or like to believe, and I enjoy believing that <laughs> scanners exist. I like the idea that people could bur burrow into each other's brains. Uh -huh. Two, I like the idea that it would be used, and I think it is plausible, that uh, intelligence communities would experiment and use scanners to attack other people. That and, I believe. And th okay. And three, I love one of the big payoff scenes at the end where this guy does battle with a computer. Mm -hmm. I love the idea that a human being's brain can be more powerful than a computer. I think it is, and I love the idea that that's the battle in the movie. So I got involved. Well, it is also neat the way Cronenberg takes just ordinary props, like when the guy attacks the computer, he does it over the telephone. And all you really see is a telephone, but in your mind, all of these amazing things are happening. So a lot of craft in it anyway, but I still vote no. You vote yes. Okay. The great French director Francois Truffaut uh, has had an artistic obsession with death ever since his earliest movies like Jules and Jim and Shoot the Piano Player. And now Truffaut has made a new film that fairly drips with death, graves, crypts, <laughs> tombs, the idolatry of the dead. The movie's name is The Green Room, and it's about a man who consecrates a shrine to the memory of all of the dead people in his life. And then he falls in love with a young woman, a living woman, and invites her to share the crypt and the memories of her dead loved ones with him. It's a macabre mutual memorial. Et maintenant, je voudrais vous demander quelque chose. Je peux Oui. Cécilia, acceptez-vous de devenir avec moi la gardienne de ce temple d'en partager les droits et les devoirs. Acceptez-vous de veiller sur eux, avec moi, sur eux tous Ne me répondez pas tout de suite si vous voulez réfléchir. Mais laissez-moi vous dire que j'attends ce moment depuis longtemps. Depuis très longtemps. Ce que je désire, voyez-vous, c'est que mes morts deviennent les vôtres et qu'en retour, les vôtres deviennent les miens. Ne croyez pas que la figure soit achevée. Il y a place ici pour tous vos morts. Simplement, leurs flammes viendront s'ajouter à celle-ci. Dites-moi ce que vous souhaitez, dites-le-moi. Ce que je souhaite Oui. Vous voulez le savoir Je souhaite que toutes ces flammes se mêlent, se fondent, jusqu'à former une montagne de lumière, un seul flamboiement. Et vous dire que dans votre vie, il n'y a place que pour une seule célébration Oui, une célébration. Non. Je veux être certain de vous avoir comprise. Ainsi, tous vos morts ne seraient qu'un seul Un seul. Oui. That's a really evocative visual look there. 
That was Francois Truffaut himself playing the keeper of the crypt, and Nathalie Bai as the woman who shares his obsession with the dead. Truffaut based his movie on a famous short story by Henry James named The Altar of the Dead, and he draws the same conclusion that James did, that some people are obsessed with honoring the dead as a means of escaping from life. The Green Room is a very strange, morose film. It's filled with candles and abandoned cemeteries and hysterical denunciations, but it's oddly effective, too. This pathetic man and his bizarre obsession kind of creep up on you. Here's a man who knows nothing at all about life or love, and the only people he can possess in this world are the people that he has already lost. You know, there's this theory about that there are two kinds of Truffaut films, uh -huh. the, the upbeat, positive films uh, like Small Change and Day for Night, and then mm -hmm. these dark, obsessive films like Two English Girls or The Story of, Story of L.H. LH. Right. Um, obviously, the, po the, the lighter films are more popular. I'm fascinated, though, by the obsessive films in, mm -hmm. uh, that he makes. Uh, you know, we accept an obsessive film like Taxi Driver in America, set in current day. This is back a few years in France, and it's a similar kind of obsession. I think you pointed out exactly. He can only relate to this woman mm -hmm. through the pictures of the dead people. He can handle that. He can't handle life. And you know, there's an interesting sidelight to this in terms of Truffaut's own life that film buffs might be kind of interested in, and that is that Truffaut spent his entire adolescence at the Cinematheque in Paris, looking at six and eight hours worth of movies a day, movies with dead stars in them, made by dead directors, but these movies were perfect. They were up there on the wall, they never changed, and he could sit there in the dark and adore them. And in a sense, apparently, when he read this story by Henry James, The Altar of the Dead, he thought, this is kind of my story, too, sitting there mm. in the dark as a, as a movie addict. So mm. it's kind of an interesting uh, I think uh, it reason is. for making the film. I think so, too. Our next film isn't great, but it does entertain. It's The Mirror Cracked, an Agatha Christie murder mystery that is quite easy to solve. And normally, that would be fatal to a mystery, except this wonderful mystery has a performance by Elizabeth Taylor, and she is very good as a faded movie queen who's on location in England making a comeback film. An old feud breaks out when Taylor's co-star and arch-enemy sexpot Kim Novak makes her grand entrance. Marina, darling, I didn't see you. I know now. What a delightful surprise. Looking lovely as always. Of course, there are fewer lights on than usual. In fact, any fewer, and I'd need a seeing eye dog. Oh, I shouldn't bother to buy one, dear. In that wig, you could play Lassie. Same adorable sense of humor. And I'm so glad to see you not only kept your gorgeous figure, but you've added so much to it. What are you doing here so early, dear? Actually, darling, I couldn't wait to begin our little movie. You know the saying, once an actress, always an actress. Oh, I do know the saying. But what does it have to do with you? Cute angel. So do tell, how does it feel to be back after being away so long? Some funny lines there, and the fact that Taylor would allow Novak to make jokes about her size shows that Elizabeth Taylor can handle her weight problem, so she may be us asking us, why can't we? <laughs> now, the film's murder mystery centers around Angela Lansbury, who plays Agatha Christie's grandmotherly sleuth Miss Marple. She's out to solve the murder of a young English woman who was poisoned at a cocktail party hosted by movie director Rock Hudson. Miss Marple returns to the scene of the crime and wants to question director Hudson. There is a lady, yes, sir. What kind of a lady? A somewhat elderly lady, sir. A Miss Marple. She refuses to leave. Shall I... No. I'll get rid of her. Mr. Rudd? Good morning, Mr. Rudd. Uh, look, Miss uh, Marble, or whatever your name is, I don't know what you're doing here, but you cannot stay. Yes, Marple, and I won't keep you long. I'm correct, am I not, that that is where your wife stood the day of the murder? She looked in that direction, and then her face froze. I think you'd better leave. Bellini's mother and child, a very fine painting, present at the Brera Institute in Milano, I believe. The whole thing is really quite simple, isn't it? I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, I think you do. Ah, oh, damn it! Good Lord. I'm Jane. I might have guessed you'd be here. This is the spot where it happened. Which makes it so much easier to understand. It's very simple. If only one looks at it the proper way. It all began, you see, with the kind of person that Heather Babcock was. Damn it, that's enough. 
the two of you come busting into my house, I want you out! Now! Perhaps you should call the police, Mr. Rudd. Let us go back, shall we? Now, the mystery story is not great, but I thoroughly enjoyed seeing Taylor and Hudson and Novak, stars of the 50s and 60s, who appear to have been hiding in a closet, waiting to be <laughs> released in an old-fashioned, entertaining film. And I think that's what the mirror crack is. That's certainly what the mirror crack wants to be. Yeah. I had a strange feeling. In 1981, I walk into a movie theater, I see a new film. Mm -hmm. It stars Elizabeth Taylor, Rock Hudson, Kim Novak, and Tony Curtis, and I am in the Twilight right, Zone. Right. I was thinking it was fun to see these people again. They held up pretty well. They're doing a pretty good job. I was impressed by Elizabeth Taylor, as you were. I liked Rock Hudson's performance. Mm -hmm. But, gee, I don't know. I like These Agatha Christie movies, I liked the first one, uh, Murder on the Orient right. Express. I didn't much really like Death on the Nile, mm -hmm. the second one. This one, I wasn't too impressed at all. The mystery is not really very mm -hmm. intriguing. It's not very bizarre. Yeah. The answer when it comes is kind of depressing yeah. and sad. Mm -hmm. It was a letdown. Well, then, let me tell you the way at least I enjoyed it. I, by focusing on Elizabeth Taylor and viewing it as her sort of comeback film. Mm -hmm. She hasn't been making good films lately. I feel badly about that. Every time I see her on the screen, I want her to be in something good and have a mm -hmm. great role. This isn't that great role yet. She's on screen a lot here, and she comments on being Elizabeth Taylor, in effect, on fans, on her weight. And I found it very entertaining, very refreshing, bold, and I think this film is going to allow her to do a good one next. Well, I hope so. Okay. Anyway, let's go along to a dazzling, deliberately overwhelming sound and light extravaganza. Our next movie is named Altered States. The movie tells the story of a scientific experiment that goes haywire, but this isn't a science movie, it's a horror movie, and it'll really work you over. William Hurt stars as the scientist who locks himself inside a sensory deprivation tank. He floats on warm water in total darkness until his mind cuts loose from all reality and begins to drift into terrifying fantasies. And in this scene, his wife tries to warn him that he's risking his life by subjecting himself to cosmic forces he doesn't even begin to understand. I don't know how even to put this into words, but I'm beginning to think that what happened to you last Friday night was not just a hallucinatory experience. I've got this gut feeling that something phenomenological did actually happen, that there was some kind of genetic transformation. I don't know why I think this in defiance of all rationality, but I do. And now that I do, I'm terrified. I mean, really terrified, petrified. So am I. I don't want you doing this experiment again next week. You have to find out if it actually happened. Now, I'm asking you to put the experiment off until we understand a little more in order to there minimize the no risk. no way you can understand this before the event. You have to work back from but the event. But you may be itself. causing yourself irreversible genetic damage. No, but we're dealing with genetics. We're beyond mass and matter here, beyond even energy. What we're back to is the first thought. Yeah, he's going back to the first thought, all right. One night, his body suddenly starts to climb back down the evolutionary ladder, and he turns into an ape. One night like that would be enough for most people, but not for this scientist. He takes psychedelic mushrooms that seem to trigger ancient memories in the very cells of his body and enable him to recreate that first moment of explosive creation right there in his laboratory. Well, now comes one of the movie's scarier scenes as his wife and colleagues monitor his regression. Look, I've got nearly 11. That's more than two hours now. I think we should stop this. I'll tell you frankly, I'm really frightened. We could be screwing around with this whole genetic structure. Now, how do we stop this? You bring him down, Arthur, he's going to be sore as hell. Oh, we should never should have let him do it. I don't know how we let him talk us into this in the first place. We we're humoring him, but we know he's not crazy. And we all know deep in our hearts that he may be on to something that is beyond our own comprehension. Now, because I believe him, I want this thing stopped. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Kind of a close encounters of the worst kind. <laughs> I think it'd be a mistake to take the science in this movie very seriously. It's obviously only an excuse for the special effects, which are sensational and are frightening. The scientist in Altered States wants to see how far he can go, how near he can come to losing his sanity and his life, and he says it's all in the name of science, but to us, it looks like madness. Altered States is scary and fun, one of the best horror films in a long time, and I think if you criticize it for not making much sense, you're just missing the point. Well, I didn't care for the film, Roger, and I even didn't care for it on the level that a lot of people are appreciating it, which is just merely the special effects. A lot of people have compared this film to 2001, the famous Star Ride sequence in there. I thought that sequence in 2001 made a lot of sense because it fit into the story. Here, I think that this film is so unsure of itself in terms of story that what happens is that the special effects, as you sort of point out, stand out separate. And on that level, they just didn't do that much for me. That could have been an action scene, other than the distortions of the face, uh -huh. in most any other kind of movie. And just with the exception of one terrific special effect at the very end, I wasn't all that impressed. I think you're being very unfair to this picture. I will defend it, first of all, on the basis of the fact the special effects and the escapism are very entertaining to the audience. But mm -hmm. secondly, I liked it because of its story, much more so than I did Scanners, which I felt didn't have a story. I think that what pulls us through this story is this guy's ego involvement. He's crazy. He says he's a little mad at one point. Yeah. He, he can't, once he gets hooked on these mushrooms and going into this tank, he can't stop. He's, he's obsessed. He wants to be, he wants to go all the way back and be Adam. And his problem is his wife isn't too crazy about being Eve. Well, just like you said on Scanners, where you thought that the characters were sort of cold and you uh -huh. couldn't get involved with them, that's sort of the effect that I, this film had on me. I really didn't care about this guy. I didn't care about his trip. And so all I saw was a lot of flashes of light. <laughs> well, there's someone to shed some light on some bad movies. Gene leaping into the balcony at Spot the Wonder Dog here to help us track down the dogs of the week, the week's worst movies. Well, my dog this week is an old movie from late December that probably thought it was going to slip by our little reviewing stand here, but no, no way. way. First Family is one of the dumbest, <laughs> most tasteless comedies ever to come out of a Hollywood studio. It's a parody of Life in the White House with, for example, an idiotic vice president who desperately wants one of President Bob Newhart's pens. I never get a pen. Oh, no, please. Wait, wait, wait. This one is just like it. Take it. Uh, this, this is the last one. Who's, who's left? That's not funny, and neither is the scene where Gilda Radner, playing the first daughter, makes love to an African fertility god. You know, you given the characters that have been performing in the White House for the last couple of decades, you'd think <laughs> it would be very easy to make a comedy about presidential life and politics, but first family couldn't even do that a dismal film i agree it was just awful and my dog this week is another one of those outdoor adventure movies where rugged families bravely go to live in the savage wilderness only to eat off of picnic tables <laughs> this movie is called the mountain family robinson and the family robinson lives in the woods they're attacked by bears they're swept away on the rapids and then this little boy gets lost in the woods and falls off a mountain while chasing an eagle's nest but the high point of the movie for me was when the family dog was chasing a bobcat and in the close-ups you can see that the big vicious bobcat is really just an ordinary house cat just think spot with a little makeup you could play a mountain lion <laughs> okay now let's recap our reactions to the main movies on this show lots of disagreement this week i enjoyed the brainwave thriller scanners but Roger didn't care about the characters, and that's why there's a yes next to my name and a no next to Roger's. He can't recommend you see it. I can. Scanners is rated R for good reason. It's very violent. We agree that Francois Truffaut's The Green Room is a minor film, but a worthy one, a worthy mood piece about one man's obsession with death. Two yes votes for that. We split on the mirror cracked. I think Elizabeth Taylor's performance overshadows a less than thrilling mystery. Roger disagrees. He thinks the whole movie took itself too seriously and a big disagreement on altered states. Roger thinks that it's an exhilarating, mind-bending trip. I find it full of flash, but empty of ideas. Well, I did like altered states, and I think on this show, that's the movie that I stand behind and I like the most. I'd recommend it. I think it's a good film. And for me, it's Scanners. 
Uh, also in the science fiction area, a lot cheaper than altered states, but that story got me involved, Scanner. Uh, altered states did not. So we still have a disagreement, okay. right? Okay. Okay, that's it for this week. Next time on Sneak Previews, we'll review five more new movies, including Fort Apache the Bronx, starring Paul Newman as a troubled cop, The Devil and Max Devlin, a comedy with Bill Cosby, and The Incredible Shrinking Woman, starring Lily Tomlin as a miniature housewife. Until then, we'll see you at the movies. Funding for sneak previews was provided by this station and by other public television stations.